Mounting questions about whether a potential witness was, yes, physically threatened in order to create a contract to keep her silence. This is a big and unusual story, and the development is coming in, of course, the Stormy Daniels case. Her lawyer saying she was physically threatened to stay silent about an alleged relationship with Donald Trump. Was she threatened in any way? Yes. Was she threatened physical harm? Yes. Can you tell us whether it came from the president directly, the physical threats? I'm not going to answer that. Will you deny that the president of the United States threatened uh, your client? I will not confirm or deny. That is unusual news that broke, as you saw right on the set of Morning Joe today, and it ricocheted quickly to the White House, where reporters asked about it, and the White House denies Trump had any relationship, and they also addressed the allegations. I'm wondering if you've talked to the president about that, if he knows who might have threatened her, and more generally, if he has any concerns about women accusers being threatened in that way. Uh, obviously, um, we take the safety and security of any person seriously. Certainly uh, would condemn anyone threatening any individual, but I have no knowledge of that situation and would refer you to the president's outside personal attorneys. Now, to be clear, that is the right answer, of course, condemning even the prospect of that kind of threat and violence. And I also want to tell you, we don't have any more details here about what Stormy Daniels' lawyer is alleging or who he's even alleging it about. Now, we can report that Donald Trump does have a history of working with people and maintaining them on staff even after there are public accounts of both verbal and physical threats. His longtime lawyer, Michael Cohen, who is at the center of this deal with Stormy Daniels, was known to carry a pistol, which is his right, but he also told reporters in 2011 his role is to fix any problem. If you do something wrong, I'm going to come at you, grab you by the neck, note the imagery, and I'm not going to let you go until I'm finished. Now, those are his words. And you can put those to the side if you want as aggressive lawyering, which I will tell you sometimes does happen, especially in the passionate heat of rhetorical debates. But I want to show you more. Look at actions from a different Trump associate, his longtime bodyguard, Keith Schiller. Now, he left the White House in September, but he remains on the RNC payroll. You can see his interaction right there with a credentialed journalist. He was removing Jorge Ramos from a very famous press conference. Schiller also punched a protester outside a Trump Tower. I'm joined by Maya Wiley, former counsel to the mayor of New York City, Liz Plank from Vox Media, who's covered these stories a lot, and also by attorney Nancy Erica Smith. Now, she represented Gretchen Carlson in the sexual harassment lawsuit against Fox News CEO Roger Ailes. Uh, welcome to each of you. This is an unusual story to be covering, and as you know, it's important in the journalistic side to be clear that it is an explosive allegation, but as I say, not one with a ton of detail on it, and I want to be fair about that. But Maya, what do you make, first, legally, of, of this lawyer going into what we expect to be a, a very controversial 60 Minutes interview in the future making this allegation? I was surprised by it, quite frankly, and one reason is because, legally speaking, since they are litigating over the question of whether or not um, the uh, temporary restraining order around the non-disclosure agreement was, a, was appropriately issued by an arbitrator. Normally, you would use a claim of physical force or co coercion or duress as one of the things you would state would give you the right to actually null and void the agreement. Mm -hmm. So that was 10 days ago that they went into L.A. Superior Court, and so it's interesting and kind of confusing that we're just hearing this today. So let's get right to it, because we, we chop it up. We're going to open with some legal skepticism. Uh, Nancy, I had a similar thought, which is the current claim from this same lawyer for voiding the contract is a missing signature and a vague claim of unconscionability, which lawyers know you kind of can throw in anything. If they had this physical duress claim, wouldn't it be in, as Maya says, in the papers? You would think so, but we haven't really seen the restraining order, so we don't know what he's been restrained about. And he was very uh, circumspect in what he said, and he was answering a question. He wasn't putting, he didn't put it out there. He was answering a question. So, uh, 
uh, you know, it's hard to tell what's going on when we have secret corporate courts in this country, where you have arbitrations, where something this important yep. to our whole nation is taking place in secret. You think this is too important to be kept out of court? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let me show uh, an exchange from another one of our, our friends of the show, talented uh, journalist Shelby Holiday, who pushed uh, Michael Avenatti, the same lawyer, on this kind of similar line of questioning earlier in the show about why she signed. Why did she sign this agreement in the first place if she wanted to tell her story? Well, I think she's going to disclose that. Uh, in fact, I'm highly confident that if this interview is aired at some point in time, that answer will be given. You're saying in the 60 Minutes interview, she is going to reveal details as to why she took the money at the time and a logical reason for why she wants to undo that? I'm not going to state exactly what's in the interview. Well, I think, what I'm you, but say, I think you did just allude to that. I, what I'm going to say is, is that that issue, I'm confident, will be touched upon. How about that? Okay. <laughs> Too many lawyers. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, it seems when we connect all these dots that he is moving forward, and he's obviously doing this in the public forum, mm -hmm. revealing little bits and bits more what he was previewing there and what he made official today is this other argument that apparently we're going to get a lot of detail on in 60 minutes. Right. And, uh, you know, Donald Trump uh, loves to criticize the media, and so there's a risk in putting all of this and, and, and letting the media sort of litigate this instead of the, the courts because he can just say it's fake news, right? Um, but, but I still think this is an important story. It's the first time that, you know, there's a story that, that, that involves a woman and Donald Trump in the post-Me Too era, right, where uh, men can't necessarily buy off women's silence and powerful men, you know, who, who were friends with Donald Trump, like Bill O'Reilly and Roger Ailes, you know, buying off the silence of women. And uh, now we are listening to what women say and, 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 and you know, what's, what, it, you're kind of wondering, what does Stormy Daniels know that Donald Trump doesn't want us to know? Well, and Nancy, I wonder if you could broaden this out for us in terms of where the legal fight and women's advocates and feminism figures in. Because what we're hearing a lot about, you know, people talk about receipts. We're hearing a lot, a lot about what I think is so important, which is legal receipts, whether it's at the Oscars and we're talking about the inclusion rider or your client, Gretchen Carlson, talking about these NDAs. Um, why do you think women's advocates now are in this place talking about these legal details and how to fix them? Well, we're in this place now because I've been a lawyer for 38 years and we haven't made a dent in sexual harassment until we had journalism reveal these secret deals. And the women don't you, want maybe them. Maybe you and Liz Plank need to pound. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Should we do it? Yes. <laughs> yes. We, uh, my clients don't want them, but they've been sexually harassed. They're hoping to keep their jobs. They learn early on, once we complain, that they're not going to keep their jobs. Maybe they're not going to keep their careers. And then they're told to shut up about it. Mm. We're tired of that. And the light of day is what is changing it. This is a critically important point, and I couldn't agree more. The, the concern I want to raise is actually 19 women did complain. Yep. In fact, their complaints and many of those complaints in New York would be a class A misdemeanor of forcible touching, and this well before Stormy Daniels, they have been trying to raise attention to this issue for months now, including as recently as December. And there's a connection though, right? Because those women were also threatened with litigation by Donald Trump. They were told in public, I'll sue you to prove I'm right. I think some Trump voters may have believed that and they may have been wrong. This is still being litigated, but that sounded tough. Let me play and then I want your response, Maya. This was how Donald Trump worded that on the campaign trail. Every woman lied when they came forward to hurt my campaign. Total fabrication. The events never happened. Never. All of these liars will be sued after the election is over. <laughs> Well, and as we know, Summer Servos has sued Donald Trump for defamation. Look, 19 women, 19. Some of those were teens in a beauty pageant that he were, literally walked in to watch them changing their clothes and then told them not to worry about it, at least allegedly, right? And so I think the point is, if anyone else in this country had that number of complaints against them, we would all be pointing to the number of complaints as as a strong indication that there's some very problematic behavior there. Uh, this is a man who is admitting this behavior. Yeah. He admitted the he uni Miss Universe peeking in on young girls, yep. and he admitted grabbing women who don't want to be grabbed. 
multiple times, actually, yes. more than once, not just the acts yes. of Hollywood. So why, why aren't we believing the women? Mm -hmm. exactly. Let's continue the conversation. I want to add in some voices from Washington. Jonathan Capehart, of course, part of the Pulitzer Prize winning team at the Washington Post, as well as NBCNews.com contributor Howard Feynman, and the panel uh, stays. Uh, Jonathan, your view of the import of this story in Washington? Um, it's very important. Uh, I think in the sort of whirlwind hurricane that is the Trump administration, it's amazing that the original story, Stormy Daniels story didn't even, in some major newspapers, didn't even make the front page. It was like buried on like A5, A17. But I think what's happening here is there's a lot of anticipation building up to this Stormy Daniels interview that she taped with 60 Minutes. I believe it was last week. It's due to come out uh, in, an, in another week from now. And what her, her attorney is doing, I think you talked about this a moment ago, is teasing out what could possibly come out from that interview. And I think in Washington, a city that at this point I think people are like, well, what, what could you possibly tell me that is going to, to shock me a year and a few months into the Trump administration? We could be looking at a situation where what Stormy Daniels says in that 60 Minutes interview could either change the entire narrative and conversation, or it could just be one more drop in, like, an oversized bucket of, of controversy. Yeah, a large... A large bucket. Uh, <laughs> Howard, I wonder if you metaphor. could respond to, to some of the points that the, the, the panelists made here at the top of the show, in, including Nancy's point that there has to be an interaction uh, between the litigation and the journalism. Well, a couple things. First of all, I think Liz and company are absolutely right that Post Me Too adds a, an extra dimension to this, and we shouldn't underestimate that as far as the general public is concerned, which isn't always following the ins and outs of the court case the way we are. That's the first thing I would say. This guy, the, to me, this story is very much more than people realize about Mike, uh, excuse me, about Michael Evanati. This guy is the polar opposite of, of uh, Prosecutor Mueller. Mueller never operates in pu no, listen to me. M Mueller never operates in public, only below the surface legally. The guy in Los Angeles is an L.A. Hollywood lawyer, but with substantial corporate experience. This guy's a piece of heavy legal artillery. He mm. really is, because he knows how to try the case in public, which is what he's doing right now. Uh, and, and in a sense, Donald Trump, the biggest picture here is that Donald Trump is in a pincer, is in the, is the subject of a pincer move by the guy who's operating legally on, on low level but serious stuff and the lower guy who's operating on something that the public, if this comes out the way it could, uh, will just be riveted by. Can you, the, Donald Trump cannot fire enough people from his cabinet <laughs> between now and a week from Sunday to keep people from watching that thing. And that's what Avenatti is doing. And I would disagree with you, Ari. I hate to disagree on a legal go point. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. But Avenatti is being very shrewd about sticking to the procedural thing first. You say, wow, well, if he's got an abuse claim, why doesn't he, uh, why didn't he put it out now? Think about that. He's Tra he's trailing this out as long as he can. He's sticking with procedure first, which is the NDA, and then going to the substance, which he will try first on 60 minutes before uh, he does anything else. He doesn't even, he hasn't filed a case against Donald Trump on the substance. This is all procedure. This guy has had two show, had, has had two topics of his, two cases of his already on 60 Minutes, and he began his career as an oppo guy for Rahm Emanuel. And, and by the way, <laughs> Rah, Rahm Emanuel did not hire, uh, to use a technical term, putzes, which is what <laughs> Michael and Cohen actually is. It, Nancy? Well, what's interesting is that Donald Trump went on the air and called all these women liars, and some of them who have NDAs, he waived his right to go to arbitration because Good he point. entered into self-help and he mm -hmm. had all these opinions and all mm -hmm. these threats and he said all this stuff and now they're supposed to shut up in a secret arbitration proceeding. He waived that. He's not going to be able to say, oh, we should be in arbitration now that I blew off right. all my steam. K part. Uh, Ari, I wanted to jump on something that uh, Howard just mentioned about Michael Avenatti. Michael Avenatti is playing this in, in two courts, the legal court, but also the court of public opinion. Right. And this is where I agree with Howard. 
there is only one court, really, that Donald Trump truly cares about uh, in terms of his public persona, and that is the court of public opinion. And he and has the people's court because it's televised, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and and so I think I think the president may have met his match in Michael mm. Avenatti because he's going uh, up against someone who is it's basically peer to peer right. when using television. Right. So Liz, Liz, case. Liz Playing take. Rules, Take yeah. it home to, the, to that point uh, that, that uh, Avenatti is, if anything, speaking uh, the president's language by making this all about a sequential, strategic media march. Absolutely. And that's what Donald Trump has been doing to us for, you know, well, well of two years now. Um, and I think that his silence also speaks volumes. Donald Trump talks about everything, right? Mm -hmm. He tweets about everything, even things that he doesn't know anything about. Why is he being completely silent about this? Briefly. All I was going to say is actually in the lawsuit they do, they do claim some coercion and it's the suggestion is that it's actually Michael Cohen. Yeah. So I'm still confused about why we're just hearing about it even on the march out. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.